Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to be on this panel. I um, want to follow up with Gerald's comments. Um, certainly, distribution SCADA has been in use in distribution systems. However, it only goes, typically goes down to covering the, the high voltage circuits, 12 kV, usually does not go down to where the DERs are at the end of the circuits at the secondary distribution at the customer level. So to provide grid services, since we are talking about real-time operations, offering services in real-time, often telemetry is needed, often real-time monitoring needed. Point I want to make is the traditional telemetry that used for SCADA systems using RTUs. Oh, sorry, they were developed 20 years or 25 years ago in the industry. It may not be cost effective for DERs. And also security and information privacy protection issues that has become very important in, in our industry may not be fully covered. That said, over past five to 10 years, the information technology, communication technology, connectivity, cybersecurity has significantly advanced. So looking at bringing real-time data from distributed resources in a cost-effective, secure, well-protected fashion in real time. There are a lot of is now available, which may not be the ones used, you know, in a transmission SCADA or traditional traditional models. So, so as we move forward with DERs, I think some attention to, first of all, cost effectiveness, that's extremely important. But cybersecurity and information privacy protection is also extremely important. However, the new technologies provide for all of those. And I think um, there may be a need for, as we look forward to 2020 and beyond, also embrace some of the newer technologies that have emerged and utilize those rather than looking at traditional models. I want to make my com uh, address this uh, for a, a particular segment of the industry, the co-ops and the generation transmission GNTs. Many co-ops opt to be members of a GNT, which typically manages 20 or larger number of co-ops. And they basically um, provide services for their members in terms load management, demand response, or DER management for the benefit of their membership. The, the systems they use typically um, involve a centralized system at the GNT level, which brings information for all the co-ops, participating resources associated with those, various tariffs or programs each member company has with, within their service territory, and then the GNT basically aggregates those and dispatches those based on the rules and the agreements they have, contracts they have with their members. This is somewhat similar to what Dr. Taft mentioned at the, at the GNT level, at the co-op level. In other words, member companies each may have limited number of resources, limited number of staff, you know, uh, a more difficulty reaching out to the bulk power market or, uh, or address related issues, generation dispatch, or things of that nature. GNT serves that purpose for them. They provide the data to the GNT. GNT basically has dispatch access, whether directly dispatching the resources of the member companies or send the aggregated dispatch to the member company for it to relay it to its customers. There are different models, but that model of co coordinating distributed resources at that level currently exists and has been fairly successful. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna kind of uh, answer this in a little bit of a broader fashion. You know, following for quarter 888, more than 20 years ago, to allow transmission open access, to allow indep small independent power producers, and then 
market participants to come in and, and improve the economics of overall supply and demand. A number of processes, procedures, methods were established, also led to creation of structured markets. And over the past 20 semi years, a lot of lessons have what we are seeing happening on distribution side with the aggregators, the DERs behind the meter assets, number of things emerging. Certainly distribution is different than transmission and we are in a, you know, in a 21st century and technology has moved, etc. But some of the principles, some of the processes, some of the issues remain the same. And, and, and the methods and things that were established for supporting the open access market-based operation on the bulk power. There are a number of lessons learned there that are, that are to, and conceptually applicable. For example, transmission reservation, capacity reservation. So I'm uh, investing in a, in a battery storage, significant investment, and I want to sell that to the market. Do I have a capability to reserve capacity on the distribution system to be able for next semester to be able to utilize that distribute that asset. What's the process there? Similar to the transmission, Oasis was created for transmission reservation. So when an independent producer built a power plant, could guarantee that they have access to transmission for exporting that generation. Then there was a ability issues. As these independent producers came come about, you got to start having loop flows and you start having you know overloads on the system. So electronic tagging system came about to coordinate scheduling of resources with transmission operators and operators that those schedules would impact. Number of years took to processes and procedures and roles and responsibilities be well defined and accepted by the entire industry. Who submits the schedule? Who can approve it? Who can deny it? Who can adjust it? what timing for adjust and then procedures for transmission loading relief tlrs and curtailment and whatnot got established so and a framework established that right now the marketplace at the bulk power working very well so building upon that, all the discussion and, and then of course you have the isos which are equivalent to the dsos that they take certain role that do some of these functions but not all the regions covered by structured market and you're allowing you know a model that um, areas that not under structured markets can operate so there are a lot of lessons learned from that process i'm not suggesting we use the same technology same capabilities that developed 20 years ago technology has advanced things work speed of light things are inexpensive capabilities available however some of the processes some of the roles and responsibilities, the processes and how the roles and responsibilities were defined by holders and that whole process. There are some good lessons learned there that can be applied as we move forward and address this whole expansion of DERs and the changes, paradigm change in the power system operation. I think uh, I want to make a comment, uh, Gerald met at the beginning. Traditional EMSs and DMSs primarily looked at reliability of the wires. Dealing with DERs, there are lots more detailed involved, commercial issues and others. If EMSs and DMSs are expanded to include DER modeling and DER operations and things of that nature. Yes, that will be helpful. However, uh, they serve certain purposes. The staff that use them are trained to do certain activities. The, go across the industry and having EMS and DMSs kind of a, come together, it is a, a, a major undertaking. However, DERMSs come to play to basically focus on DER operations, DER modeling, 
model the distribution grid down to the secondary, down to the connection to the DERs, model the storage assets, model the scheduling functionalities needed, model the smart inverter capabilities that an asset can provide reactive power and active power, etc. You know, there is a, there is a, and, and technologically, architecturally, from a technology architecture, um, the EMSs and DMSs kind of have been around for a number of years. Uh, the, architecturally modifying them to address these things is not a small undertaking. So probably the answer is to augment the existing DMS and EMSs with the DRMS and integrate DRMS with those technologies.